account seems to be working, no? Okay, cool. So we're ready, no? Perfect. Okay, yeah, we are gonna start. As usual, we, we, we normally have some small technical difficulties when we start every course, not to say almost every lecture. Um, welcome to this computer architecture course. Um, it's uh, really nice to have you all here. I think that there are more registered students than the uh, number of people that I see right now in the room, but hopefully more people will join. If not, I'm pretty sure that they must be attending in Zoom or in YouTube, because as you know, this course is, uh, everything is live streamed. Um, today in lecture one, the what we are going to cover is just uh, Introdu an introduction, and, and I'm going to share some basics about this course, about the research group that we belong to, the Safari Research Group, and uh, you will also have the opportunity to ask anything about the course or about the research that we do or um, about um, anything related to logistics, even though we will have um, a some part of tomorrow's lecture will be devoted to uh, discussing the logistics, what are the uh, different parts of this course, and, um, and you will learn more about the people who are involved in this course. This course is uh, led by Professor Ronur Mudlu, which is not me. Uh, he is a professor at ETH Zurich, and um, I am part of his research group. Uh, my name is Juan Gomez Luna, and I work as a senior researcher. I'm one of the instructors in this course, same as Mohamed Sadar, also another uh, senior researcher. And um, this semester, Professor Mudlu won't be so much available for teaching. So uh, the, the two of us will be teaching as well as some of our more senior PhD students. Even though he is the um, leader of the group and of course is the most knowledgeable person in the group. But the nice thing is that this year you're going to uh, interact directly or more directly with us, uh, because even though we are not so knowledgeable, but we are pretty well specialized on the different topics that we work on. For example, I work mostly on processing in memory, and this is why I'm going to teach the two lectures on processing in memory next week, uh, together with today's lecture and tomorrow's lecture as well. Um, let me uh, start. I mean, I have like 400 slides, but I don't plan to <laughs> share the 400 slides with you. Uh, hopefully if we reach like half of the presentation. That will be more than enough. The presentation, the entire presentation must already be available in the, in the course website. So for your own study or for your own learning. Um, but uh, yeah, most important thing is that today the goal is to introduce a course. We are going to do it in a more or less relaxed way. Uh, we are going to talk about many different things that will be later um, more explained in much more detail in, in the course. Uh, so yeah, for now, I think today should be a pretty uh, relaxed lecture. Let me start talking about Professor Ronald Mutlu. He is a full professor at ETH Zurich. He joined ETH in September 2015, as you can see on the slide. Before that, he was a, a professor at the at Carnegie Mellon University, and, uh, and he has also a, a ample uh, industry experience. As you can see, he has been working in Microsoft Research, but also in Google, VMware, Intel, AMD, etc. His PhD is from the University of Texas at Austin, and before that, he studied in the University of Michigan. And for many, many years, he has already been doing research and teaching in computer architecture, systems, hardware security, and bioinformatics, uh, with an emphasis on all these different topics that you can see here. This is basically what we are going to talk about. We are going to uh, introduce the research group, the Safari Research Group, and uh, the main research topics that we work on. Main uh, research topics that are basically all research topics in computer architecture, because uh, computer architecture, as you will see today, is a very ample field that uh, covers many different parts, of course, of the computing system, such as the uh, processors and accelerators, um, even more specialized accelerators, such as graphic processing units, but also the memory. There are different types of memory 
uh, that are used in computer systems these days. Some of them are more expensive. Some of some of them are cheaper. But the, and then because they have different purposes, so they have also different uh, features as, and characteristics. And we will also talk in this course about persistent memory and storage. The goal uh, in this course and the goal of our research group is to build fundamentally better architectures. So let me uh, elaborate on this over the entire lecture. Um, with, and let's start with uh, four key current directions, uh, research directions in our group. The first one is building fundamentally secure, reliable, and safe architectures, because if uh, the system that you work on or you work with is not secure, reliable, and safe, then you'll have an issue. And we are going to uh, talk about security, and we are going to talk about uh, reliability in, in several lectures in this course. Um, another important goal or important research direction is building fundamentally energy efficient architectures, energy efficiency and high performance are key goals when building compute systems, right? And uh, we will have um, sort of an intensification on, or emphasis on memory centric or data centric architectures. Uh, these, the, the, the two lectures that I will uh, deliver next week are about these kind of architectures that are, and, and today pro probably we will also uh, introduce them with a little bit of detail. Um, these uh, memory centric architectures are basically new systems where uh, the memory has changed or is changing its role. Uh, if you think about the uh, most of current computing systems and most of the uh, things that you have studied until now during your uh, bachelor's degree are systems where the memory is just intended to or designed to store data, to keep data ready and available for processors to use it. There are different types of memories. I'm pretty sure that you are uh, perfectly aware or perfectly, um, um, you know perfectly uh, about uh, cache memories, register files, different uh, levels of the cache hierarchy, the main memory. You also know that what, what a storage system is, right? And, um, and, and if you think about that view of the uh, system that um, you have seen until now, memory is just for storing data. However, accessing memory is a big issue. Why is that? Because accessing memory requires us to go very far away to bring the data to the processor. And that's an extremely costly process, uh, process in terms of execution cycles and in, in terms of memory, uh, sorry, energy consumption. So that's why we are uh, moving toward a new direction, a new paradigm that makes the memory more intelligent, more capable, and embed some sort of compute capability in this memory. Uh, another important research direction is fundamentally low latency and predictable architectures, because latency is also important. You will see many examples in this course where we try to maximize the throughput, meaning we try to do as much work as we can in, uh, in, in the unit of, uh, unit of time, but there are also some applications, important applications that require us to be as fast as possible. Think, for example, about uh, machine learning inference or uh, neural network inference, right? Uh, if you are an individual user, you want your data to be, your uh, results to be served as soon as possible. So you want low latency in the execution. And another important research direction in our group are specialized architectures for different domains. I uh, yeah, was just talking about uh, AI and machine learning, but we also work a lot on genomics, uh, medicine, health, uh, genomics will be an important part of this course as well. Another of our PhD students, uh, Jan Firtina, works on genomics, on bioinformatics, and he will probably deliver uh, some good lectures about uh, bioinformatics. Okay, so uh, working on all these different directions uh, requires us to understand the entire, what we can call the transformation hierarchy. Transformation hierarchy, because we start from the top, where we have a problem, where we are, we want to solve a problem, for example, a matrix multiplication, right? Or we want to use this matrix multiplication for uh, something uh, more meaningful than just uh, multiplying and adding. So we have a problem and we want to solve that problem. If you want to solve that problem, what you have to do is uh, creating a way of solving that problem. And that's the algorithm. 
right? But now you can write your algorithm on paper, right? You can take some notes. I'm going to do this, 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 and that. But then you need to translate that to a language that is understood by the computer. And that's why we need, uh, we need uh, programming languages and we need all programs. And, uh, and those programs are given to the uh, system software for their execution. And then from there, we start, let's say, touching the hardware, right? The program that we write in a high-level programming language, let's say C or Python, needs to be compiled to some other language, more low-level language that is understood by the hardware. And this is what we can call the hardware and software in, or the software hardware interface. This software hardware interface delivers the instructions to be executed to the different components of the, of the processors, different execution units, and those are the microarchitecture. And how are these different components built? If you look at them closely, you will see that they are composed of logic, of gates with the Boolean logic, right? You are familiar with all of these. And this logic, these gates, at the same time, are composed by devices, like transistors, for example. And those transistors work because there are electrons that move from here to there. So in the end, we need to transform the problem that we want to solve as users of the system into the movement of electrons. So we really need to understand all this transformation hierarchy well, even though if you look at the traditional view of computer architecture, you will probably restrict yourself to this narrow view of software hardware interface, the instruction set, basically the instruction set that the computer understands and the microarchitecture. So all these different blocks that are connected to each other, like ALUs, registers, memory, etc. right? If we want to do a really good job and we we'll really be able to build fundamentally better uh, architectures, we need to have an expanded view that goes from the problem and the algorithm to the devices, okay? And that's important because understanding the entire stack, the entire hierarchy also allow us to better optimize the execution of our programs on whatever system that we are using. Uh, this is a very recommendable uh, lecture that was given by uh, Richard Feynman back in 1959. It was like very um, uh, forward looking um, um, lecture that he gave. And, and, and look at the title, there is plenty of room at the bottom, an invitation to enter a new field of physics. What was he uh, proposing? He was proposing to improve the bottom of the compute system, improve the semiconductor, semiconductor technology, trying new techniques or trying new materials. So he, this was very inspiring um, lecture for many, many years, and it, it keeps being a very inspiring lecture, and that's why we recommend it to you. But uh, it's not only the bottom, it's not only the devices, the, the movement of the electrons that we have to focus on. We can also improve the performance of our, problem, of our programs and, and the, their energy efficiency, and we can solve our problems in a more efficient way if we look at the top as well. And that's what inspired this uh, more recent paper in the science journal uh, in 2020. There is also plenty of room at the top, as, as you can see. And what this newer paper advocates for is that we also put an effort on the higher levels of the hierarchy, including the software, the algorithms, and the hardware architecture. So observe how we really need to understand the entire stack that you see again there on the right-hand side. We need to understand it and try to optimize as much as possible everywhere. Sometimes the, 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 the thing to optimize will be the software itself. Other times we might come up with new algorithms that are better suited for the specific architecture that they are going to run on. Or sometimes we will have, uh, we will work on building newer, better architectures for a specific problems that might be new problems as well. And we are going to talk about many of these examples. But for you to have a very, you know, like let's say naive approach to what I mean with optimizing software and hardware, 
this is um, an example of optimizing software and it's it's actually coming from the same paper and um and here well it's it's just a uh, um a matrix matching multiplication right we are we want to multiply two matrices of uh, uh where each of their dimensions is uh, 4096 elements right 4096 rows and 4096 columns in both matrices you all are familiar with matrix matrix multiplication uh, since you were in the high school, you know that uh, to perform this operation, what we basically have to do is the dot product of one row of the first matrix or each row of the first matrix and each column of the second matrix. And this way, by multiplying and accumulating, we are going to obtain the elements in the, in the output matrix. Um, matrix, matrix multiplication is extremely important these days. It's, it's been, I guess, important for many, many years, but these days it's especially important because it's the key operation to train neural networks and also to do inference when we can do batching, meaning that we can serve multiple requests at a time. Uh, so that's why many systems, and we are going to talk about some of them today, have been optimized to perform matrix multiplication in the most efficient possible way. But it's not only the hardware, right? It's not only the hardware that we can optimize. We can also do a lot of work in software. If we write this code in Python, it's going to take all, the, all that uh, large amount of seconds, which is more than seven hours. And that's extremely slow, right? Because, you know, 4,096 is a large number, but it's not as, not as large. In, in, in the end, um, if you think about large language models, for example, that are so popular these days, uh, that size of the matrices that they are using might be even larger. So observe that, you know, seven hours to uh, execute this matrix multiplication on Python doesn't look like a good idea. So we can probably uh, use other type of software or more optimized software or more optimized programming language for a start to reduce that, uh, uh, that time. And we can also use techniques like parallelism that can better exploit the hardware resources in order to further optimize the performance. And we can even go not only using different cores in the same CPU, but we can go even deeper and use SIMD units or vector units that all CPUs have today. Uh, for example, the AVX intrinsics from um, Intel uh, x86 processors. And in the end, you'll see that you can accelerate the execution of this matrix multiplication by a lot, more than, well, almost uh, 63,000 times, right? So this is just a very straightforward, let's say, or very naive example of uh, how much you can do if you optimize your software as one way of optimizing the um, execution of programs in the entire system. Our axiom in this course and also in our research is to achieve the highest energy efficiency and performance. And to do so, we must take uh, the expanded view of computer architectures. This expanded view spans from the problem to the electrons. And this requires us to co-design across the hierarchy from the algorithm to the device. I gave you the example earlier that if you uh, have a specific problem, one possibility is to adapt the algorithm, change the algorithm to make it more suitable uh, to the underlying hardware, right? Uh, so that's what we mean by um, hardware software co-design or software hardware co-design. And we are going to talk about some of, uh, of uh, some more examples uh, later in this lecture. Um, and um, another uh, thing that we'll have to do is to specialize as much as possible within the design goals. And this, uh, I mean, in the end, specialization is the best that you can do. If you are a doctor, you probably want to specialize on um, a particular uh, domain of the medicine. Maybe um, you uh, get, um, I mean, you, you are an oculist and get specialized in the eye or um, otorhinolaryngologist <laughs> and get specialized on the throat, on your ears. The same thing we can do with computers, right? But at the same time, uh, it's not good that doctors only know one specific part of our body, only the, the eye, for example, because the eye is connected to other parts in our brain or uh, other organs in our body are connected to uh, many different parts in, in our body. So it's good that they also have, um, let's say, relatively wide view of the body, right? So with computers might happen the same. 
we might want to uh, have a computer that is mostly specialized for a certain operation, let's say matrix multiplication, but you will probably need some other operations that maybe you don't use so frequently, but still you need them to be there. For example, uh, in large language models, uh, these days we are using a lot matrix multiplication and matrix vector multiplication, but we also are, we are also using softmax activation functions. And softmax is based on exponentiation, which is a completely different operation than a multiplication or an addition, and is more complex. So your software, even though you will do well if you design your, your hardware to uh, be very efficient with uh, matrix multiplication. You also want it to be able to perform exponentiation or softmax in some ways. Uh, feel free to ask any questions, or if you disagree with anything I'm saying, go ahead and tell me. Uh, as I said, uh, even though I will try to go as, as fast as possible, but uh, well, we are right now in the slide number eight so no rush uh, we can chat as much as you want and we can uh, solve any questions or issues that you may have okay so more uh, about the major topics that we work on uh, as i said the mission or the main goal is to build fundamentally better architectures uh, if we go a little bit deeper into the different topics um, spanning, of course, the entire transformation hierarchy. Uh, we work on data-centric architectures. I already mentioned what data-centric or memory-centric architectures are. Uh, in the, um, uh, we, we will talk about processing in memory, processing in, in DRAM. We will talk about non-volatile memories in this course as an alternative to DRAM that has uh, pretty nice features that can be uh, very useful, but at the same time, there are important challenges to enable uh, their adoption. Uh, we will talk about uh, low latency and predictable, arch predictable architectures, fundamentally secure, reliable, and safe architectures, specialized architectures for different uh, applications. I already uh, talked about machine learning and AI. I mentioned genomics, graph processing as well is a uh, very important um, domain of uh, algorithms or field of algorithms that are more and more use these days, for example, in the context of social networks, but also in the context of uh, AI and machine learning. You might have heard of graph neural networks. They are kind of similar to, let's say, dense neural networks or uh, the, the deep neural networks that we have been using in the uh, past 10 years, but uh, or developing in the past 10 years, uh, but they have more specific characteristics, more challenging characteristics, because graphs are um, more irregular, more sparse, and, uh, and we need to, uh, you know, target the operations uh, on these uh, graphs in, in different ways, or at least design our software and our hardware taking their specific characteristics in mind. Okay, and data-driven and data-aware architectures. For sure, we will have also some lectures about these. Um, examples are uh, ML and AI-driven architectural controllers and design. Um, you might know, well, I mean, there are uh, different uh, types of controllers in, 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 a, in, in the hardware, in the, in the compute system. You can think, for example, about the control unit that decides what's gonna be the next threat to schedule in a multi-core processor or in a GPU. Or you can think about the uh, cache controller or the memory controller that decides what addresses are mm, going to be accessed, accessed next, depending on what are the uh, memory requests from the, from the programs, right? If you think about how those controllers have been built over the years, over the decades, uh, they mostly use um, heuristic approaches. And a heuristic is basically a rule that is designed by humans. And we tell the, uh, the, we, um, we tell the memory controller, for example, if you have a row, uh, you, you have opened a row uh, inside DRAM, try to use that row as much as possible. So prioritize, the memory addresses that go to that row. And if you want need to read addresses that are in that row, bring those cache lines first before opening a different row. And that's down for energy efficiency and for performance. Uh, but that is just a human generated heuristic, right? Which works pretty well, but not well in all, all cases, right? Uh, so this is why today uh, people are developing 
machine learning and artificial, in, artificial intelligence driven heuristics or policies. So you can have some sort of artificial intelligence there that analyzes the memory addresses that are being accessed and based on that decides what's the next row to address. That's just uh, one simple example. Or you might have heard, you might be familiar with prefetching as well. What's prefetching? Are you guys, do you guys know what prefetching is? Prefetchers are, well, we can do software or hardware prefetcher. If we think about hardware prefetchers, we can think about um, special units near the or part of the CPU or uh, other uh, processor that access the memory in advance before the actual processor, because the, before the actual program needs the data, right? You can think of, for example, if you have an entire matrix and you are going to, or an, an entire array, and you need to access the entire array sequentially, and you're going to access all elements of the array sequentially, you will first access the first cache line, let's call, let's call it cache line zero, but because you know has your access, you know that afterwards you will access cache line one and then cache line two and so on, right? The hardware uh, may know that uh, or might or can be designed for that and bring those cache lines earlier and put them near the processor before they are needed, right? And I'm just giving you a very simple example because if you have a streaming access, you're gonna access all uh, addresses of an array in sequence, uh, then that's fine, right? That doesn't need any sort of intelligence. You just know that you need to do that. But there are workloads that have more sophisticated access patterns. Some of them are random or pseudo random or strided. And we can have specialized prefetchers that are based on machine learning and AI that can detect automatically what are the patterns in the addresses that are being accessed. And based on that, prefetch what most likely will be used later. Okay? Okay, so these are uh, some of the research topics in the Safari Research Group. This is the website of the group. Uh, you can learn a lot about each of us in, the, in, in that um, um, page and also about you know publications and also about the a master thesis or semester projects that we offer. And um, so, yeah, I would really encourage you to, to take a look. Um, and this is our motto, uh, think B and high. <laughs> and this is a picture of some people of the group. Not all of them are uh, in the group anymore. The one on the right-hand side is uh, Professor Mudlu. Um, is a very large group, as you see, is, uh, well, not, not so many people in, in that picture, but in total right now, we must be around 40 people, uh, including um, senior people like me or Mohammed, PhD students, for example, Ataber, who was somewhere around there, master students like Melina, for example, visitors like you, uh, Lenny, she's also a postdoc, and, 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 um, um, uh, Zulal is a PhD student as well. She's visiting us from uh, Bilken University, uh, from a group that we collaborate a, lo a lot with uh, on bioinformatics. So, well, uh, I would encourage you to talk with us. Uh, some you, you will see different people here uh, teaching, but also uh, in this part of the of the classroom as well. Uh, all of them uh, are somehow uh, in, in some way involved in the course. So you can ask questions about the course, about the research that we do, about the possible uh, master thesis or semester projects that, uh, that we can offer. And uh, yeah, you are uh, welcome to interact with uh, all of us as much as you want. And uh, also we uh, uh, encourage you to learn about what we do in the group. And uh, we try to disseminate everything we do uh, regarding research, regarding teaching, as you will see, um, we publish a, new, a newsletter every now and then, maybe once or twice every year. This is the edition from January 2021, from December 2021, and the most recent one is from June in this year. It's, uh, <clears throat> the newsletter is basically a summary of you know, uh, research that we have been doing, talks that we have delivered in different places, and, um, and um, yeah, some more news and information about the group. Um, and and as, as I said, it's a large group, but it's also a, let's say, consolidated group with a lot of people who have um, um, been part of. Uh, this, this is just a list of, 
uh, former PhD students and postdocs of uh, Professor Mudlu. As you can see, most of them or all of them are working in top companies and, and universities, and, uh, and they have been very successful people. You see many, many awards there. Um, another recommended uh, lecture or talk, this one uh, delivered by Professor Mudlu himself, um, uh, from the computer architecture seminar. I will, I will soon talk about this seminar, um, but yeah, this is also an introduction to the Safari Research Group. And I think that this one can also be an interesting talk to you or some of you, especially if you're thinking about doing a PhD, because it's uh, about applying to grad school and, uh, and how to do impactful in, uh, research. So if you are interested in doing research in the future, um, well, might uh, be worth uh, watching this, uh, this talk. Uh, because research is very important, as you will see, or as you uh, might be observing, this is a very um, uh, research-oriented course, uh, because that's, you know, it's uh, where we spend most of our time, and uh, all research is very important for teaching as well, and both are connected to each other. On the first uh, in the first place, you need to have, uh, so we first need to focus on teaching and you as a students need to focus on learning because you need to learn the fundamentals, you need to, le to learn the basics before you do research. But then after you're doing research, this research should also become part of the teaching. Why is that? Because we are improving uh, computer systems every day, every day, right? And it's uh, good that people learn about the um, uh, most recent advance advances and uh, the most um, uh, cutting edge research. In fact, we will have uh, several lectures, uh, at least one, if not two lectures in this course about the cutting edge research where, where we will directly um, uh, give you, you know, like kind of research talks about uh, some of our more uh, recent um, uh, publications. And everything is uh, publicly available. Um, we upload all, all lectures. That, that's why this lecture, for example, is being live streamed uh, to YouTube because they are, first of all, useful to you, uh, ETH students uh, who um, have, um, you know, are, let's say, more closely working with us. But, uh, but yeah, many of these lectures and many of these talks are also uh, in relevant or useful uh, for, for other people everywhere. So, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, this is, uh, you know, like a screenshot of, the, uh, of our channel, Honor Moodlu Lectures. So, yeah, you will um, find all materials there. For example, the uh, two most important courses uh, of the, that, people in the Safari Research Group or Professor Mudlu teaches himself. The first one is the Digital Design and Computer Architecture course that probably some of you have taken. Who, who has taken the Digital Design? Only one person? Seriously? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, for, for those of you who uh, didn't take the, the course, I would uh, encourage you to take a look at the lectures and or I mean, that, that's the, uh, the link to the playlist. But, uh, but in a later slide, uh, we will also have a link to the lectures of the, of the most uh, recent edition of the course in spring 2023. So you have all the slides there, and I think it's good for you to take a look at those lectures, see what contents are you more or less familiar with, because in the end, uh, this uh, computer architecture course that we are starting today is based on uh, the, all the background that we provide in the first course, in the bachelor's course, so as, as, as uh, is, uh, I guess, sort of obvious. Uh, for the computer architecture course, we have a website, probably you have already accessed it to uh, check today's slides, uh, but if you want to have, let's say, the, the whole view of the entire course, uh, take a look at this playlist uh, and the uh, corresponding website as well, because there you're going to see the entire uh, list of lectures that we covered uh, in the last fall semester. And, and this is the, yeah, you have more links here. Uh, this is uh, the fall 2021 edition. This is the fall 2022 edition. So exactly um, uh, what we uh, cover um, in the uh, in the last uh, last course, last semester, last fall semester, uh, many of the materials will be the same, even though we update the materials every year, of course. Uh, but uh, but yeah, um, it might be good for you if you if you want to start, you know, 
studying or learning a little bit in, a, in advance. And, and this is the, these are the links to the um, digital design and computer architecture course. So uh, it's, um, yeah, it's also here for, your, um, uh, for you to check. Another uh, course uh, that, that we teach every semester, and actually we start today as well at 4 p.m., is this seminar in computer architecture. So it's a kind of nice complement to uh, the digital design computer architecture course and these more advanced uh, computer architecture course. What we mm, basically do in this uh, seminar in computer architecture is to assign research papers, depending on what are each of the students' interests, and, uh, and, and, and the students uh, study the, the papers in detail, uh, uh, in depth, uh, and also, you know, um, the kind of the field that the uh, paper is about or the topics that the paper is about, and then they present and, uh, and they, uh, students have uh, good discussions in, in the lecture room. Um, uh, and, you know, we, we present them or students present them over the semester. I think it's a, a very nice experience for everyone. So uh, if, if you really like computer architecture, I think that this can also be a nice course for you to take. But these are not the only courses that we are teaching. We have more specialized courses for smaller group. These are called uh, projects and seminars uh, in, in the IT department at ETH. Um, and, but, but yeah, good thing is that the materials are available to everyone. For example, this one is about memory um, with an emphasis on um, uh, memory controllers uh, using uh, SoftNC, which is a FPGA-based memory controller um, that is uh, designed by our group and is used for many research studies. For example, research on the Rohammer phenomenon or the Rohammer uh, problem. Have you ever heard about the Ro Rohammer? Probably have heard about Rohammer. You're gonna talk. You're gonna hear much more about Rohammer in this course. I think we're gonna have one or two lectures about Rohammer. So um, it's, uh, I think it's, it's going to be fun for you. It's not the only one. There is also another one on memory systems. This one is uh, more focused on, let's say, simulation of uh, DRAM and other types of memory using Ramulator, which is also one tool developing our group. It's, um, it's a, a software simulator. Nice thing is that you are going to uh, get familiar with this uh, Ramulator because one of the labs in this course uh, will require you to use uh, Ramulator. And I was talking about memory-centric computing systems or systems with processing in memory capabilities. So we also have a, a processing in memory course uh, that is uh, also uh, happening almost every semester, not this semester, but the last edition was from uh, spring 2023, even though this slide is uh, from the uh, fall 2022 uh, edition, because the lectures here are a little bit longer and more comprehensive if you want to uh, take a look. Uh, I talk about uh, genomics and bioinformatics as well. These are an um, important part of the research and the teaching that we uh, do in the Safari Research Group. So we have a couple of uh, genomics courses. This is uh, one of them, and they are also starting right now. Um, even if you don't enroll yourself in the courses, you might want to take a look at uh, the materials. For example, the materials of this uh, heterogeneous uh, so this course on heterogeneous systems. Uh, here we introduce different parallel and heterogeneous architectures, and we have a special emphasis on graphic graphics processing units and on GPU programming. But um, I think it's a kind of a general course as well, where we uh, explain uh, different parallel patterns. So uh, even though uh, you will see that the examples are focused on, on GPUs, but uh, these parallel patterns are uh, widely applicable uh, to other parallel machines as well. So this might have also some uh, interesting materials for you. One more, this one is uh, hardware software co-design. We are, we are already talking about uh, hardware software, software hardware co-design uh, today. Uh, this one is uh, focused on that. There is an emphasis on virtual memory systems as well, uh, or this other one, which is about storage systems and SSDs. 
Um, we will also talk about SSDs in this course, but maybe one or two lectures. If you are interested in this direction, for example, in doing research in this direction, we will probably uh, point you to this SSD course. You can access all of them from our uh, Safari website. And, um, and yeah, um, most uh, recent version of this website is fall 2023, the semester that we are starting now, but you can access the, uh, all the past materials as well. And these are not the only things that we do for, you know, um, teaching and, um, and, and knowledge in general. Uh, we also organize uh, special sessions and we organize tutorials in, in uh, major conferences. For example, this is a uh, session on in-memory processing that we organize in the IES VLSI uh, symposium in last year in 2022. And in this year, um, we have organized several editions of a tutorial on processing in-memory systems with uh, some talks uh, by us, either Professor Mudlu or me, uh, but also um, uh, invited the speakers from, uh, from uh, academia, from industry. For example, in HPCA, we had uh, Dr. Manuel Legalo from uh, IBM Zurich talking about his research on computational phase change memory. Uh, it's an extremely uh, interesting and forward-looking uh, field. We repeated this uh, tutorial again in the ASPLOS 2023 conference. This time we had uh, invited speakers, uh, for example, Professor Sasha Fedorova from the University of British Columbia, and also um, John Ki Kwong and Eddie Park from uh, SK Hynix, is a the major DRAM vendor, and they were talking about their uh, processing in memory architecture that I'm going to uh, show you probably later today. If not, uh, you will, uh, we will cover it in, in kind of detail next week. We had one more edition of the uh, real pin tutorial. This one was in Niska in June. And, uh, and here we also had um, uh, invited speakers, for example, uh, Dr. Sukhan Lee from um, uh, Samsung. He also talked about what Samsung is doing in the context of processing in memory, the devices that, we are, that they are developing and also partnering with AMD to integrate processing in memory capabilities in AMD GPUs and also in Silinx. FPGAs, and we will have the probably uh, last uh, edition of this iteration of the processing in memory tutorial in micro 2023, and this is going to happen uh, in October 29th. And the reason why this slide is here is uh, to offer you the possibility to attend not in person, not necessarily that you go to, um, uh, to the conference, but uh, in YouTube. Uh, you will uh, be able to attend all the different lectures uh, that we will cover here. Um, so yeah, if you are interested, and hopefully you will, because processing in memory is a key part of this course. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's here and you have the, the link to the um, uh, website and also the link to the uh, YouTube live stream. So we're gonna try uh, to um, encourage you to focus on insight and on developing new ideas in this course. That's uh, key to do, uh, to, to do uh, research and to be efficient at learning as well. And this is where you have to focus, focus on learning and on scholarship. Uh, from our side, we will try to create an environment that values free exploration, openness, collaboration, hard work, and creativity. And you're gonna have many opportunities in the course. There is like a minimum set of things that you can do in the course, which is attending the lectures and doing the homeworks and doing the lab and then taking the exam, but you can do much more. You, can, you will be uh, encouraged to read many research papers. You will be encouraged to uh, work with us closely, for example, with a, a semester project, and hopefully um, uh, you will have uh, overall a good experience. Uh, always think that the best way of uh, succeeding is to produce high quality work, right? And uh, the only way to uh, produce high quality work so such that you can have large impact as a student of this course, but later in whatever you do in your professional career is to work hard and also stick to the um, uh, fundamental principles that um, define how uh, 
um, computer systems uh, work and how can they uh, how they can be efficient from the point of view of the energy consumption or the performance. Um, same as all the people that have been delivering Safari Life seminars. These are uh, is a, a series of talks that we uh, organize from time to time pretty frequently. Uh, some of them are given by us, some others are given by people in, uh, in academia, in industry that we invite. The most recent one was yesterday um, um, about um, uh, um, nanopore sequencing and, and, and bioinformatics. Um, uh, you can access uh, the, this, this seminar because it's, a, it's also in YouTube uh, and all past seminars and, and the upcoming seminars as well from this uh, page in our website. Uh, two upcoming uh, seminars are uh, this one by uh, Minesh, Dr. Minesh Patel, who was a PhD student and also a TA in this course uh, until last year, I guess. Um, uh, he is a specialist in, in, in different scaling and, and I'm pretty sure that this is going to be also very uh, interesting uh, talk. Uh, we will uh, probably announce it again as it's approaching so that you, you attend it. And, uh, and also this one uh, by Jiang Jing Li from the University of Chicago. This one will happen in October 17th. And it's about how bit flips can affect the um, um, operation of deep neural networks. So as you see, our group is very open. We try to disseminate all the research that we do, the teaching, uh, by making all materials available. For example, open source artifacts that you can find in our uh, GitHub uh, repositories. These are just uh, well, some of the examples in the, or some of the repos that you can find in our GitHub. Uh, everything is here. There are simulators, for example, MQSIM, which is an SSD simulator. Um, there, there, there are, um, the move is also a simulator and a, and a benchmark suite, same as uh, Prim benchmarks is a benchmark suite for real processing in memory systems. But there are also, you know, uh, Sneak is a, a, a pre-alignment filtering algorithm for genome analysis uh, with implementations on CPU, GPU, FPGA. Uh, yeah, in the end, we try to make everything public and also uh, well documented. If you take a look at the README, um, you should be able to understand a lot of uh, what the, each of the repos is about and, and how to use the code, etc. And, and here you can find um, a few more links to uh, important uh, so, uh, tools that we have open sourced. Okay, more here and here. And everything is, um, again, publicly available. Well, I guess that these are the uh, most important links, the link to the uh, GitHub, repositories, the YouTube channel, and these two are uh, publications uh, of uh, Professor Mudlu is uh, always the most uh, updated reference for any publications from our group. And as I said, um, the goal uh, in this course and also the goal in our research group is to create an environment that values free exploration, openness, collaboration, hard work, and creativity. So, I hope that um, yeah you like it, and um, and I hope that you'll have a very very um, successful experience in this course. Some suggestions to you: uh, these are directly from Professor Mudlu. Uh, follow your passion. Do not get derailed by naysayers. Uh, whatever you do in life, especially if you do research, either in academia or in industry, there will come someone who will tell you, no, this is not going to work, or no, this is not efficient, or no, someone has tried it before, tried this before, and um, yeah, they didn't succeed. It. Okay, that's uh, true in many, many cases, but it's also true that the best ideas have also received uh, no some time uh, in, the, in their beginning, right? So uh, follow your passion and don't get derailed. Follow your passion and keep insisting, keep working hard because you probably have a good idea and it's worth uh, pushing it a little bit more and exploring and finding, I mean, until this idea is in, let's say, in its best, best shape uh, so that you can make a contribution to science and technology. And so, 
but but you know enabling your passion is not just as simple as saying oh i have an idea and just uh, write a couple of lines in a napkin or or in a, a little sheet of paper uh, you need to build an infrastructure and that's something that we have to do every time that we want to try new ideas in computer architecture we need to that's why we need to use simulators because if you have an idea let's say I'm going to try this optimization for the prefetcher or this optimization for the replacement policy in the cache memory. You cannot build a new prefetcher or fabricate a new computer, a new processor with that new prefetcher or that new type of cache memory, right? Because that's extremely expensive. And especially in academia, we cannot afford those expenses because most of the times, the first time, the first time you try and the second and the third, you will be wrong, right? You need to keep refining the design. Uh, so that's one reason why we use simulators, for example. And that's why you're going to get familiar with simulators, for example, uh, Ramulator in this course, because that's the infrastructure that we need to build to test the different ideas that we may have. And you have to work hard, not only to enable your passion, but also to pass this course and be resilient, <laughs> be resilient as well. Sometimes you will feel overwhelmed. The semester is long, it's like 16 weeks, right? And this is not the only course that you're taking. So someday you will feel like super overwhelmed. Oh, I have to finish lab three and also homework four and the exam is approaching and I didn't understand this or that and I still need to read. 35 papers, okay, that's true, but you know, you can do it, be resilient, trust yourself, and you will do a very good job. Uh, I don't know exactly what are the, you know, um, um, percentage of people who pass the course, but it's probably 99.9%, .9%, right? So, and many, many people got six. So in the end, you will see at the end of the semester in January, you will look back and you will say, oh, this was easier than I thought. Yes, because you were resilient. <laughs> okay, so focus on learning, focus on scholarship, and think about the quality of your work. Uh, we are uh, kind of, you know, serious when we um, evaluate uh, the whatever you hand in uh, the lab or the or the homework, the exam as well. We try to be rigorous. Of course, we also understand the difficulties that you may face. So um, we we always try that that, that you get the best of your of your of your work as well but uh make sure that you uh deliver high quality work because that's uh key you know to pass this course but in the end it's key to be uh, successful in i would say almost if not all aspects of, of life because you can make a good impact on the world if you do good job high quality work and you work hard uh, well, these are just some uh, a few slides from Professor Mudlu in order to, you know, inspire you and, and also, um, 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 you know, um, kind of try to convey what's a mindset that you need to have to approach this course. If you want to learn more about uh, his uh, point of views and uh, how he understands teaching and doing research, I would recommend you to take a look at uh, some of his past um, uh, talks, uh, for example, these two about computing research and education and the, uh, the one he delivered when uh, he received this uh, Maurice, uh, Maurice Wilkes Award uh, on uh, some, um, some uh, reflections on, on DRAM. As you'll see, DRAM is a very important component, not only in the system, but also in this course. We're gonna have several lectures about DRAM. You will learn a lot about DRAM. And uh, yeah, and also yeah, to learn more about um, uh, our research group and 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 how you know uh, Professor Mudlu's views on how to build an impactful research group. There you have one more talk, and one, uh, a few more here uh, on you know um, general ideas about research or this one that I already mentioned earlier. If you are interested in uh, doing research and in academia in the future, doing your PhD. Another required reading and also very uh, inspiring for sure is this, uh, this uh, seminar or this talk that uh, Richard Hamming gave many years ago in 1986, you and your research. Um, is, uh, this is like, the, I would say, the first required reading in this course because it's a, a very inspiring thing. I think we are going to, uh, we are going to see a quote of it um, in a few slides. 
but but yeah, uh, this must already be in the um, in the website. So yeah, please download and read it. And and as I said before, um, it's it's uh, it's a lot about you know having the right mindset uh, uh, always in life, but in particular in this course. Uh, so. Um, and hopefully in the end, you will have a good experience. And hopefully you, the day that you um, fill the survey that the ETH will, will send you one of these days, uh, you will probably give us good feedback uh, on how to improve the course, but also on your own experience. And, and here in these slides, you just have some, you, you have some you know, um, quotes of uh, different things that uh, past students uh, said about this course. It's been a formative experience, high investment and high return. High investment meaning there is a lot of work to do, but also high return. You will learn a lot uh, about computer architecture, about bioinformatics, about how to optimize your programs and how to optimize your systems in general. Um, people are also happy with the recorded lectures because we, you can go back to the lecture to whatever we are explaining, maybe not today, which is not the, you know, it's, it's important, of, of course, an important uh, lecture today to introduce the course and, and all the different um, things that we are going to cover, but it's not the most technical thing, but uh, that might take, you know, um, a few, a little bit more time to understand. You can um, go back to the recorded lectures uh, because they are they are always available. Uh, some people like to watch them in their TV. Um, in general, people is happy with the lecture. Well, this is about Professor Mudlu. He's very responsive uh, to the questions and remarks from students. But we all try to be uh, same way, very responsive and 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 help you as much as you need. Um, some other people saying that um, they are happy with the. Um, um, with the YouTube lectures, even better than in-person classes because you can ask questions asynchronously in YouTube, also in Zoom, there is a chat, as you know, you can type your question there and probably some of us who will be monitoring uh, the, the chat uh, can answer even before uh, you ask the question to whoever is uh, lecturing that day. Uh, it's an easy to understand course format uh, with homework, labs and lectures. As you'll see, I think that you know, all different assignments are well defined. We have been uh, improving this course. Uh, he wants to watch it in YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, uh, yeah, it's uh, I, I, I would say that the course is well defined. There are paper reviews, assignment labs, etc. Uh, and it, we have been teaching this course since uh, fall 20, uh, 2017. So it's already like six years, right? So. Uh, and we have been refining many things, not only the lectures, but also the labs, homeworks. There have been new labs. Even uh, last year, we created a new lab on processing in memory. Um, so yeah, I mean, let's say it's a consolidated course and, 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 and we believe that you can have a, a good experience. And uh, there are people who are, uh, you know, really happy with the course. Okay, so uh, focus on the learning experience, uh, focus on the long-term trade-offs. So even though you might make a strong effort, a big effort uh, right now, but in the, in the, in the, near, in the future, uh, you will realize how much you learn and how useful the contents of this course have been for your career. Uh, it's uh, take it also as a way of improving your critical, critical thinking and the um, decision-making and uh, focus on the concepts and ideas that we'll cover. We will talk about the fundamentals, about the basics, that's important, but also combined with the cutting edge research as well. So not only uh, focus on what has been doing for decades, but also on what is being done right now, because that, that's going to be important for uh, the future. And it's a hands-on learning. The course is um, a lot based on your own work, and that's why the percentage of the total grade uh, that must be uh, something that you must have seen in the course catalog uh, the, the, the from, from the total grade um, a large percentage I think is like 50 percent is for the labs which is where you are probably going to spend most of your time um, but yeah mindset is the most important thing because this will determine what you get out of the course and going back to uh, Richard Hamming as I uh, said this is the First required reading because it's important for the mindset. This is uh, Richard Hamming with his chat. Um, you need to know yourself 
you need to know your weaknesses and you need to know your strengths. Uh, because if uh, that's the case, if you know yourself well, you can even make that a defect becomes an asset. Uh, the people who don't have the right mindset, they don't work on important problems and they don't become emotionally involved, right? If you could become emotionally involved, you would probably end up doing better work. Um, and these people say that, well, it was just a matter of luck. But there is no matter of luck. There is just hard work, you know? Um, not from, uh, not from uh, Richard Hamming, but from a very famous painter, uh, Picasso. He was one asked, uh, where did you get the inspiration from? And he said, I don't know. The only thing I know is that inspiration always comes when I'm working. So this is what you have to do. And in the end, you will become great scientists or at least great students of this course. Okay, any questions so far? The, uh, the, the lecture is until four, no? So what, what's the right time for a break? We can have a break. You want to have a break? Okay, let's have a break. And after that, we will talk more about why to study computer architecture.
Okay, I think it's a um, good time to continue. Um, we were here, uh, slide 83. Why study computer architecture? We are going to talk about computer architecture, why computer architecture is important for you, why computer architecture is important for computer systems these days. Uh, I, I will give you some uh, examples uh, to, uh, for, for you to understand uh, what we mean, and, uh, and we will start somehow, um, um, you know, um, digging into the different uh, research topics that we work in the group and that we will cover uh, in this course. So computer architecture is the uh, science and art of designing computing platforms, including hardware interface, system software, and programming model with certain uh, design goals in mind. And these design goals might be general, like let's try to create a general purpose processor, a general purpose system that works pretty well for any type of workload, or they can be more specific. Like for example, let's accelerate some workloads, certain workloads as much as we can. For example, uh, neural networks. Let's create an accelerator for neural networks that is the highest performance and the uh, most uh, energy efficient one. Or we might want to optimize for different goals, like for example, um, um, extending the battery life uh, for a specific system, for example, for a cell phone that fits uh, in your pocket, or the best average performance across many different workloads, as I mentioned earlier, with the best performance and cost ratio, or many different things. Uh, so, but um, if you think about the different platforms, different compute systems, there are many differences between them. So, for example, a supercomputer is completely different from a smartphone, start, starting from their size and from their power consumption, right? But still, many fundamental principles are similar. Why is that? Because um, you want to, if you want to save energy, what you um, make sure, uh, what, what you should try to do is to move data um, the least that you can, right? Uh, because, for example, moving data is uh, very expensive and consumes a lot of energy. So those uh, fundamental principles are going to be covered in this course, and we are going to give you many uh, different examples of how to optimize uh, systems for a specific goals. Um, and, uh, and here you have uh, different uh, examples of these platforms, platforms with different goals, like a desktop uh, processor, a desktop system, or a cell phone. If you think about them, they are different, right? They, are, uh, they have been designed for different purposes, at least in principle, but at the same time, they have many similarities. They have uh, similar processors. These uh, computer here has a CPU and has a GPU to generate the graphics on the screen. And these two processors also exist in the cell phone, even though they will be much smaller, right? There are also um, accelerators of different types, for example, for encoding uh, video that exist here and also exist here. Uh, there are uh, um, devices for uh, storing data like SSDs, even though they may have different size and different capacity, but the fundamental principles of the operation of these SSDs is going to be the same. So um, yeah, these are just two examples. If you um, go to a more specialized system such as this drone, you might need to have some small processor, maybe an um, 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 embedded core that uh, is able to perform many different operations to control uh, the, um, the, this uh, specific platform, but you will also have more specialized uh, units as well for whatever uh, processing type of computation that this device has been designed. Observe that this has a camera, right? So probably you'll have some sort of accelerator for the images and the video that this um, uh, drone is capturing. Or if you have a self-driving car, you will need uh, different uh, requirements as well. Um, probably a relatively large uh, computer uh, you need uh, as well to make the right decisions because self-driving is, um, is um, pr pretty challenging. Uh, and a completely different system as well. For example, this data center uh, has completely different requirements, but again, uh, uh, fundamental principles will be the same. And here you have another one 
a supercomputer. This one is a picture of the uh, Tianhe 2, which was back uh, in 2015 or so, was the fastest supercomputer on Earth. It's uh, in China. This is a more uh, recent one, Fugaku uh, supercomputer. And, uh, and here you have a, a, another type of platform as well. This is a, a, a TPU. You must have heard about this. This is from Google. And what's a TPU? It's a specialized processor for a specific operation, a specific operation that is important for the workloads that Google Fox wanted to target. And what are those workloads? They are tensors, right? These are uh, the um, uh, data structures that are that we operate on uh, in machine learning in 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 deep neural networks mainly, and uh, and if you look at how this uh, accelerator, this processor is um, designed, is uh, basically a, a systolic array. Uh, systolic arrays uh, are um, um, specialized units for matrix vector and matrix matrix multiplication. You basically uh, feed uh, data from here, uh, the the input uh, from here, and uh, perform multiplications and divisions here in this matrix of uh, multiply and accumulate functions and get the result from here. Uh, systolic arrays are uh, very important these days because they are probably the most efficient unit to perform matrix vector multiplication. They themselves have the shape of a matrix. So that's uh, probably the reason why, and, and they have uh, many, and so all the different processing elements are connected uh, to each other in a network, and that's, uh, you know, they, they kind of mimic the uh, matrix itself, right? And how the operation, uh, dot product operation itself uh, is done, and this is why they are uh, so efficient as matrix multiply units. Uh, systolic arrays, even though uh, they have, they are being a lot used for, uh, deep neural networks these days. Uh, tensor processing unit is uh, from 2017, the first version. But uh, you can check the literature and you will see that uh, systolic arrays were greatly, uh, were a lot um, uh, studied and uh, improved in the 80s. And uh, if you guys, take, you guys take a look at the contents of the digital design and computer architecture course, Professor, Professor Mundlu has a lecture on systolic arrays there. Probably 10 years ago, uh, um, um, whoever uh, thought or, or learned about systolic arrays might have thought that, well, this is not used anywhere. Uh, there are other ways of performing matrix multiplication, but then suddenly we have a, 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 a radical change in the landscape of applications with the, uh, the advent of deep neural networks and suddenly systolic arrays uh, become one of the uh, uh, compute units of choice if you want to accelerate this sort of computation. So that's why it's so important to understand fundamentals and to understand the principles. Um, here you have a, another version. This is a more recent one, probably the most recent one is a TPU version 4 uh, from 2001 uh, because in neural networks uh, keep uh, increasing the requirements. They are bigger and bigger, and we'll probably talk about more about this uh, later in the course. Um, they are uh, uh, much, much bigger, you know, total amount of parameters and weights uh, is already in the, in the order of gigabytes, and, and you need um, giga, more than gigaflops, you need ter teraflops or even more uh, to compute, to train these deep neural networks. Um, as, as you see, well, there, had, there has been um, a, a huge advance just in four years for, from this uh, uh, initial version of the TPU to this one, uh, more recent one from 2021. In fact, well, here you can compare to the previous version, which was TPU3. Uh, it's, uh, it's more than two times uh, faster, right, in teraflops per second. But this is not, it's just one example of uh, a platform that is for a, a specific goal. Here you have uh, a different platform for uh, a, a similar goal. In this case, uh, is this uh, ML accelerator from Tesla. Uh, it's uh, interesting that it has uh, two redundant chips for uh, better safety because, uh, well, it's a um, safety critical operation, what they are doing. Um, Tesla keeps developing their, their uh, systems, their platforms for training, for inference. These are, uh, here you have a couple of slides about the uh, Doyo chip and system. As you see, it's composed by 
tiles. If you look closer at these tiles, you will see that they resemble a lot the TPU or the systolic arrays because they are for tensor computations, right? So uh, that's what you need. But uh, it's also uh, pretty interesting as an heterogeneous system. There are different types of processors, like for example, where there is a regular CPU, there are these tiles for matrix multiplication, but there are also uh, some other type of processor, these DIP. There are also different types of memory. The CPU has normal DRAM, DDR, X, um, um, but uh, this DIP has HVM memory. So yeah, it looks like a, a pretty uh, interesting system. Also um, with, uh, you know, the targets uh, really um, very concrete requirements. Uh, by taking a look at the, uh, at the D1 chip uh, that composes this uh, Doyo system, uh, observe the type, of, the type of computation that it can do. Well, these are the, you know, raw performance numbers that are not so interesting in reality. I think that is more interesting to look at these. What are these? These are the data types that it can operate on. Observe that it doesn't operate on integers, for example. I mean, or at least it doesn't seem to be um, um, uh, specialized for, for integers, but uh, this uh, brain float 16, which is one of the uh, most used uh, formats uh, for real numbers in uh, neural network training and inference. They also have a format on eight bit floating point uh, because one um, um, important way of optimizing the training and the inferencing neural networks is uh, quantization and try to use um, smaller formats, uh, shorter bit width while at the same time maintaining the accuracy. Uh, people working on uh, machine learning are, are putting a lot of effort on that because in the end that means that you uh, will be able to compute much faster, right? So if you operate on 8-bit floating point, you are potentially twice as fast as if you operate on a 16-bit floating point, right? Um, and then, and they, people are developing different formats with different characteristics, trying to be you know, like more uh, accurate for, or more precise for very small quantities and not so precise wherever you are, you have uh, more robustness, let's say. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an example of a specialized architecture for a, a specific purpose. And here you see uh, one more um, slide about this system. Um, and what, well, well, this uh, is, I guess, this plot is about, uh, you know, the requirements for the networks, because as I said, they are evolving pretty fast and their uh, uh, performance requirements and the total uh, amount of uh, um, parameters that they need to use is increasing a lot. Uh, but, you know, same as we are talking in this course, um, um, it's, it's not only about designing the chip or whatever is on top of it, like how to connect different chips. It's uh, the entire stack, right? It's, uh, it's like, this is kind of a simplified view of the transformation hierarchy that I showed you in the beginning, right? If you want to have an efficient system, for a specific purpose, um, in this case, training um, uh, neural networks, uh, uh, you, you, uh, you better have the entire stack uh, as much specialized as possible. Another interesting platform as well for machine learning is this um, Cerebr Cerebra's wafer scale engine. It's, um, uh, it's interesting just, well, for many reasons, but one of them is that uh, it's the largest uh, accelerator for machine learning. It's, uh, it's an entire wafer, it's about this size. And uh, in fact, you can compare its size to the largest GPU. This one in the picture is the A100 GPU. It's not the most uh, recent architecture from NVIDIA, but is um, from 2020 or 2021. And observe what's the large difference in number of transistors, the total size of the, uh, of the accelerator uh, in the end, because there is a lot of processing to do, right? And there is a, a, a lot of, uh, in, in, in training, for example, uh, you need to uh, repeat the same operation again and again until uh, you reach the desired accuracy. And this is a very large system, but you might need to operate or you might need to use much smaller systems. Uh, this is just uh, an example of, uh, well, device for genome analysis that can be connected to a cell phone, as you see. Completely different purpose, so completely uh, different device as well. And uh, 
or this platform here, which is an example of memory-centric computing system. Uh, we are going to talk about it um, in, you know, with some detail maybe later today and the um, uh, lectures next week. Uh, as, as you see, it's uh, uh, composed of a, a CPU, dual-core CPU um, that you can see there on the, on the slide. And then there are a lot of themes. Some of these themes are DRAM, and other DIMMs are PIM enabled memory. They are, well, regular DIMMs, DDR4 DIMMs that you uh, plugged here into uh, the corresponding slots. Uh, the uh, interesting thing is that inside these chips, there is not only memory arrays as in these chips here, but also a small processors, a small processors that you can use for computation. So that is what makes, well, that, that is what enables us to call these a memory-centric or data-centric computing system because memory is no longer dumb, it's no longer just a place to store bits, it's also a place where you can do computation. And you are going to learn a lot about this processing in memory system, but also others as well. And in fact, one of your labs is going to um, be about programming this system. So again, what's Computer architecture is the science and art of designing, selecting, and interconnecting hardware components and designing the hardware and software interface to create a compute system or computing system that meets functional, performance, energy consumption, cost, and other specific goals. So it's all about uh, designing uh, computing systems that are efficient uh, on the specific goals that we target. And that, as you know, requires us to extend this narrow view of the uh, computer architecture to something larger. This expanded view that goes from the very top of the um, uh, transformation hierarchy to the uh, bottom of it. And uh, you, we already uh, talked about this. Um, it's important to optimize the, both the top and the bottom. And, and, and you for sure remember this uh, example as well of what could build, what can be the effect of doing the um, appropriate software optimization. More reasons for you to study computer architecture. You can enable better systems, make computers faster, cheaper, smaller, more reliable uh, by exploiting the advances and the changes in, in, in circuits and technology. Uh, we are talking about new sort of platforms that appear for new applications, but we will also talk uh, later today and later lectures, we are going to talk about new technologies that can also be used, even new materials that can be used to make computation more efficient. Uh, we can enable new applications. Uh, there are many different examples. For example, uh, 3D visualization was probably uh, pretty challenging to do with machines from uh, you know, uh, 20 years ago uh, or self-driving cars. Uh, or uh, personalized genomics, for example, in, in the um, area of self-driving cars and on the artificial intelligence and deep neural networks. If you think about, uh, I mean, this is not something new, right? You might have heard about Alex, AlecNet. You might have heard about the uh, rapid uh, evolution that uh, artificial intelligence has had in the last decade, right? Uh, I think everyone is aware of that. Um, uh, some people also scared about that. Uh, but um, but it's not really something new. I mean, these um, uh, algorithms, these techniques, these models were invented many more decades ago. The thing is that uh, we didn't have uh, the right platforms to make use of them. Not only the platforms, but also the data that we need them. As you know, uh, to train a deep neural network, you need to provide a lot of training data, very large amounts of training data. Uh, there are data sets of uh, terabytes in size. Um, that was a problem probably uh, 30, 40 years ago because there was no internet. So people were not producing as much data, as much information as we are producing today. But it's what, it was not only that. It was also that we didn't have computers that were fast enough to train these um, uh, models in a, a reasonable amount of time uh, until someone decided that we could use graphics processing units, which were originally designed for graphics, for you know, showing those uh, uh, pixels on the screen. Uh, someone thought that we could use that 
large amount of compute power to perform other type of computations, right? Like for example, matrix multiplications. And it turns out that matrix multiplications or tensor computations are extremely or important, the fundamental operation of deep neural network training, right? So if you have the data and now you have the machine, the processor that can run these um, uh, really fast, you can enable a new field of applications such as self-driving cars. And this uh, basically explains uh, why we observe uh, so much, um, um, so, so many advancements and, and so much uh, progress in the development of uh, uh, these um, um, solutions these days. So we can enable better solutions to problems um, um, uh, with uh, you know, better software, with better hardware as well. Uh, so this is why we need to understand why computers work the way they do. Uh, so it's a very exciting time to study computer architecture. I'm glad you're here. Uh, and uh, one reason is that industry is in a large paradigm shift. Many things are changing because there are new problems, there are new applications, and we need to run those applications well. Uh, but at the same time, uh, new applications and also new hardware and new software create new difficulties, new challenges that need to be solved. Because it's not only about uh, having a fast processor, it's also about accessing data as fast as we can. For example, that's uh, the memory bottleneck. But we may also have reliability problems. Why is that? Because if we want a computer, a processor to be faster, what we normally do is uh, go into a, um, a more advanced technology node and fabricate the transistor uh, even smaller or fabricate the DRAM chips and uh, the, 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 the DRAM cells even smaller to have more capacity. And the uh, smaller you go, the more problems you are going to have with reliability. Uh, I already mentioned uh, the Rohammer phenomenon that uh, some of you, if not all of you, are familiar with. Uh, one of the reasons why Rohammer, uh, the, the Rohammer phenomenon exists is the, that the technology node has been shrinking for uh, many decades in, in DRAM in order to fit more data, in order to fit more bits inside the same chip. But now if you go to the point where the capacitor that can that needs to keep the zero or the one, the bit value, uh, this capacitor is so, so small, it's more uh, likely that its charge is going to be perturbed, right? It's going to be more likely that it's going to um, uh, have uh, suffer a bit flip, which is basically when the uh, uh, value uh, uh, stored in the DRAM cell uh, changes, right? And that uh, is because of the natural evolution, or that's natural with the evolution of the technology itself. So there are many different uh, challenges that we uh, need to, uh, need to uh, tackle or programmability problems as well. Uh, if you, you, can, you can learn to program, you know, like when you're bachelors, you probably learn uh, C, Python, Java, et cetera. Unfortunately, uh, these programming language are not applicable to any single accelerator that we devise, right? And we need to learn new ways of programming. Parallel programming is a subject that wasn't uh, really studied in, 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 in much detail in, in, um, and in the programs and at the university 30 years ago. Why was that? Because most of the machines were not parallel. We were just using um, uh, sequential processors. But at some point, multi-core processors start to appear and we need to develop efficient ways of programming these new systems. And now you have um, libraries like OpenMP, for example, that is pretty easy to use if you want to launch multiple threads running on a multi-core processor. But then uh, I, I gave you the example of uh, GPUs and how they have evolved. Uh, in the last 15 years or so, they became more general purpose. So uh, GPU companies like um, NVIDIA or AMD uh, created also their frameworks to program these uh, new um, systems, no? the GPU for general purpose computing. So that required us to also learn how to program these GPUs. It's parallel programming, but it also has its own characteristics. It's not the same to write a parallel program for a multi-core CPU with two, four, eight cores than uh, write a parallel program for a, a parallel processor with thousands or even millions of threads, uh, such as a GPU. Even though 
uh, some of the you know uh, parallel patterns or uh, programming uh, fundamentals are the same. Uh, yeah, but even more if you specialize the architectures more, right? So it's always uh, a, a challenge to um, improve the programmability because also improving the programmability will allow more people to learn how to use those systems, right? And that will um, increase the, uh, let's say, the uh, market share of a, a specific device. Okay. So there is no clear definitive answers to these problems, basically because the problems never finish. The problems uh, always exist as long as we keep developing uh, the systems, the processors, and the way that we use them. So um, yeah, all these problems affect all parts of the computing stack, and this is why we need to focus on the entire transformation hierarchy. There are new issues at the bottom. I gave you the example of DRAM, for example. We, we go uh, smaller and smaller in DRAM, so we start having reliability problems. We start having bit flips, so we have to deal with those issues. Uh, there are new demands on the top. If I have a new accelerator, I need an efficient way also to program these. And uh, not only that, it's also that the users themselves are also evolving, right? We as users are changing and they, uh, the, our own needs and our own requirements also change. So there are no clear definitive answers to these problems. And this is why it's so important to study computer architecture and be ready for the different landscape that we will have in the near future. And um, yeah, I guess that uh, we have also, um, well, we are, I'm giving you examples of how things have changed in the, um, um, in, in recent years, in the, in the last decade at least. And, and, and yeah, uh, these changes have somehow um, affected all different parts of the, of the, um, of the uh, computing system, right? From the uh, processor itself, um, 30 years ago, uh, probably we didn't have multi-core processors. There were GPUs, but they were only used for graphics, uh, for images, and uh, today we are using them for general purpose computations. Uh, there, there was uh, DRAM, but the way DRAM work has also changed over time, uh, but now we consider as well different types of uh, memories uh, which have different characteristics. I, I think I have a slide later about the Intel Optane memory, which is a, a potential replacement of DRAM uh, that can offer much larger capacity in the same space, even though it, uh, it, uh, it also has higher latency. So everything has pros and cons. Uh, storage has changed a lot a few years back. We were using hard drives. These days, we are using SSDs, which are way, way faster. And these SSDs keep evolving. They're becoming faster. But not only that, um, 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 SSD vendors, for example, um, Samsung, but also um, 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 yeah, other vendors as well, they, are, um, they keep developing these SSDs. Uh, for example, to provide them with some sort of compute capability. That's what it's being called computational storage, but also to change the way that we access the um, SSDs, as you will see in the corresponding lectures, SSDs that are accessed in large blocks, typically eight kilobytes or 16 kilobytes of data at once. Uh, that is good. It's, uh, it's good for certain purposes, for throughput. It's good, but uh, when you want to, you have a, a workload that needs to access more, let's say, scattered data or sparse data, accessing eight kilobytes at once is not efficient at all. So that's why uh, vendors are developing these days memory semantic SSDs, which are SSDs that you can access at the cache line granularity. So as you see, uh, components uh, keep evolving um, very rapidly. And uh, all these evolutions, well, sometimes are successful and sometimes they are not. Uh, but anyway, uh, from our point of view, the point of view of academia, all the experiences are very important, very relevant, because even, the, even if uh, something is not so useful or applicable right now, it can be useful or applicable in a few years. Okay, so. Going back to our axiom, uh, to achieve the highest energy efficiency and performance, we must take the expanded view of computer architecture that goes from the very top, from the problem, to the uh, bottom, to the devices and the electrons, and co-design across the hierarchy from the algorithm uh, to the device, and also specialize as much as possible within the design goals. 
if you want to be efficient, you need to specialize, but depending on your goals, you might need, you might want to focus just on a specific application, or you might need to focus on more, um, you know, um, uh, different applications. Uh, well, again, uh, here you have a few more slides about this um, um, speech, this talk from uh, um, uh, Richard Feynman. Um, there's plenty of room at the bottom, uh, as I said, it was really uh, kind of um, um, uh, forward looking and, and prophetic in some way. He even talked about, uh, well, denser computer circuitry, which is what we are doing um, more and more and, uh, or even, you know, um, futuristic applications like swallowing the doctor, no? This is kind of um, um, forward looking the nanotechnologies. And this other paper, also very recommendable. Uh, plenty of uh, uh, room at the top, uh, focus on improving the system, improving the software, the algorithms, and the hardware architecture. And by doing both, uh, we can achieve what's our axiom, right? Um, um, achieving high performance and high energy efficiency by uh, uh, working both on the top and on the bottom and try to do it uh, with this expanded view, uh, communicating well and uh, connecting well, co-designing all the different layers. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so let's continue. Now, a few more examples of uh, the kind of work that we need to do, connecting all the different layers, this hardware, software, software, hardware, co-design. Like, these are like, cross-layer design examples that I'm going to show you. Uh, I will uh, talk very briefly about each of them, uh, but uh, yeah, we'll probably, well, you, you'll probably have uh, these as required, some of these, if not all, as required or recommended reading. So for sure you can learn, or you'll have the opportunity to learn much more about each of these papers, but also uh, we will cover some of them in the lectures themselves because they are uh, relevant for the uh, goals of the course. Uh, this one, for example, even, which was uh, presented in 2019, enabling energy efficient, high performance, deep neural network inference using approximate DRAM. What is what we call approximate DRAM? Well, you guys know what is DRAM, right? It's a type of memory that keeps data in small capacitors that are called DRAM cells. Uh, if we want to access this uh, DRAM cell, uh, what, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not the DRAM expert in the group. Uh, there is a DRAM expert there who is Ataberg, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, so how, how does DRAM work? You have, uh, imagine that it's a matrix composed of many cells, and these cells are connected in rows and also in columns. If you want to um, access uh, data from the, from the DRAM, the well, first thing that you're going to do is open the row. Open the row means that you enable the transistor that gives you access to each of the DRAM cells, the capacitor, or let's say the DRAM cell is the transistor and the capacitor, right? So you enable the capacitor and the, sorry, you enable the transistor and the small DRAM cell starts leaking charge onto the bit line. This bit line is connected to a sense amplifier, kind of um, um, uh, operational amplifier that amplifies the a voltage that uh, appears in the bit line, right? So I open the cell and the capacitor starts leaking the charge. If you have a zero, the voltage of the bit line will go down. If you have one, you have charge. So the voltage of the bit, the voltage of the bit line will go high. And then at some point you enable the um, sense amplifier. And after that, you can read the data, either zero or one. That's how DRAM operates. Uh, so, um, but now what happens? We have been shrinking the size of these devices for a long time. Uh, so um, they are so small, the capacitors are so small that they have very little amount of charge. So it takes a while until this charge goes to the bit line and it can be sensed, right? So we need to respect those latencies. We need to respect a certain latency, certain time, amount of time and interval, until the, we can activate the sense amplifier to read the data, right? What would happen if we reduce those intervals? What would happen? Likely that we will re read wrong data, right? But the closest that we are doing, that we are going to the, let's say, right amount of time, the right interval, the more 
um, uh, the more um, correct bits we will obtain from memory, right? What's the bad thing of doing this? The bad thing is that we are going to read uh, ROM values, right? We are going to read ROM bits from memory. But uh, the good thing is that we are also accelerating how memory operates. We are reducing the latency so we can read data faster, right? For some applications, and deep neural networks are an example of it, some errors in the bits are okay. You know, if you have a, you think about the number, a very large number composed of many, many bits, 32 bits or something. If you change the least significant bit of this number, yeah, the value is changing, right? But maybe it's changing from uh, 3,506,000 uh, to 3,506,001, right? If we change that, just the least significant bit. So that little change might not be that terrible. In fact, it's not that terrible, right? You think about real numbers. Real numbers, many of the real numbers have an infinite amount of uh, decimals, right? The decimal part. And we, in the end, need to chop them. Even if we use 64-bit uh, floating point representation, we are chopping. We are not representing the real value. We are representing just a truncated value, right? So we are already approximating. We are already approximating even when we say that we are doing exact computation. So the same can apply to the way that DRAM operates. So that's what we can call approximate DRAM. And what was the key idea in this work was to do deep neural inference in your processor, but operate DRAM with reduced latencies, with reduced intervals. We know that these intervals are going to cause, are going to produce errors. That's why we call it approximate DRAM, but those errors are tolerable. And why are they tolerable? Because deep neural networks are very robust. They are kind of resilient, same as you, right? So it's fine if some of the bits of the weights of the network have changed, of the bits of the input has changed, as long as there are not many errors, the accuracy will be okay. The accuracy of the uh, DNA inference will be okay. And that's why uh, we can do these kind of things. Why is this uh, like, uh, an example of hardware software co-design? Because we also need to uh, you know, retrain the networks a little bit so that affects the software in order to, tolerate, to better tolerate the errors. And at the same time, we are changing the way that we use DRAM. Another example of hardware software core design is this uh, SMASH, also from 2019. This was led, led by uh, Konstantinos, one of our uh, PhD students. Uh, he's also a TA of the course and probably will give uh, some lectures as well. Uh, this is um, 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 a good example of hardware software core design because here is not only about well, it's, it's all about the sparse matrix operations, right? The sparse matrix computation is challenging. In dense matrix computation is easy. We have seen already uh, examples of dense, dense matrix computation. You have uh, uh, two input matrices and you perform the multiplication. It's a, mm, a dot product operation to calculate each uh, element of the output. And that's it. It's extremely regular, right? And that's why it's so fast in systolic arrays or so fast in GPUs or other parallel machines. But if you have a sparse data, that means that most of the elements of the matrix are zero. And if they are zero, it doesn't even make sense to store them in memory, right? Imagine that you have a, a matrix that is uh, 4,096 times 4,096 in size, but only, I don't know, a few hundred elements are different from zero. Are you gonna store all zeros in memory? Makes no sense, right? So for sparse matrices, we use compressed formats. Uh, basically, well, the simplest way of compressed format is like, okay, this is my value, 38.3. And this value, 38.3, is in row three and column two of the matrix. So I will just store the value, 38.3, the column number and the row number. That's a way of compressing, right? That's a COO format. Uh, so yeah, compression is uh, extremely important to save memory space, to save storage space when we are using sparse matrices. But the problem with these storage formats is that 
you really need to go to memory first and check what's the uh, column number and check what's the row number. And then you need to go to memory again to grab the value, 38.5, right? Uh, so that's costly. Uh, what is what we propose in this uh, work here? A new uh, scheme, a new uh, approach to compression that is using bitmaps, uh, a bitmap, as you probably know, is like a data structure that has zero or one, depending on whether we have a, an actual value or not. So if we are um, storing bits, of course, we are saving a space with respect to storing 32-bit elements, right? So uh, we can, it, it's okay to store a zero instead of, instead of uh, using 32 bits to store that zero, just use one bit. So we are still compressing a lot. So the um, uh, Smash proposes a new uh, compression format, but also a new accelerator or some acceleration units to put next to a CPU or next to a GPU to read those bitmaps in an efficient manner and access data from memory in an efficient manner. And this way accelerate sparse matrix operations a lot, right? In the paper, indeed, I think that there are implementations for sparse matrix vector multiplication and for sparse matrix matrix multiplication. So it's an example of hardware software co-design, meaning we are going uh, from the top to the bottom of the transformation hierarchy, proposing something that is software like a new compression format and also new instructions as well to make use of the accelerator that we are also proposing. Or this other one is uh, Genasem, is uh, presented in 2020. It's a high performance and low power approximate string matching acceleration framework for genome sequence analysis. Uh, as I said before, you're going to learn about bioinformatics and genome sequence analysis in this course as well. Uh, but yeah, um, most uh, uh, important thing that you need to understand right now is that genome sequence align, align analysis is uh, based on um, aligning um, reads that come from the genome of a person to the reference genome. You know, you might have heard about the reference genome. It was uh, first published, I think, in 2001 or 2002 after many, many years of research. Uh, the whole reference genome is like the, okay, it's like a, let's say the standard genome of uh, all human beings, right? But now if uh, a doctor goes and extracts some blood and uh, analyzes your uh, genome and extracts your DNA, um, the sequencing machine uh, is not going to provide you the entire, the entire chain of uh, ACGT that is in your chromosomes. Uh, and, and this entire chain has uh, like three trillion um, um, different uh, base pairs, ACGT. So it's super long, right? It's like three gigabytes of size. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, the, um, the sequencing machine doesn't provide you with that super long chain. It just provides you with short fragments, with short pieces of that. And you're gonna get a bunch of those. Hundreds, well, hundreds, no, probably millions of those that are in size, not three trillion, no, are in size, maybe 100 base pairs or 1,000 base pairs or 10,000 base pairs. And now you need to know where to place each piece. The good thing is that we have the reference, right? So this is like a puzzle. We go, we take one piece of the puzzle and look for the place in the entire picture of the puzzle. Where should I put this piece? That's what we do when we do sequence alignment. Uh, if you think about it, the process, because in the end we are comparing base pairs and these pair, base pairs are A, C, G, T, so they are characters, is very similar to a string matching problem, right? Same as if you are using grep in your Linux machine and want to search for a specific uh, um, um, sentence no? or, or a, a couple of words, right? In, in, in your um, uh, entire, file, entire file system. So it's, it's, it's kind of a similar thing. It's a, a string matching problem. I have a string, which is a reference genome. And I also have another string, which is uh, each of the reads of my uh, uh, DNA, of my, of my genome. And I want to go and find what's the right place of placing it. And there are different algorithms to do so. Uh, most popular ones are Smith-Waterman or Needleman-Bunch. But they, you will learn about them, but they are quite expensive. So in this work, we 
made use of an existing algorithm that is called BITAP, and is usually more efficient because it's uh, bitwise based. So it's, it's, it's usually um, less compute intensive as the, uh, than the um, algorithms that are normally used. So in that sense, it's good. It's good for performance. The algorithm itself had a problem is that uh, we couldn't find uh, the, the original algorithm that uh, can do the approximate matching, but doesn't really tell you what are the differences between the reference and your reads. And that's also important. Those differences are important, for example, to um, um, diagnose uh, diseases uh, that might, you know, might, you may have in your in your genome. So those differences are important. So what we did in this work was first devising an algorithm, uh, or let's say an extended or an improved algorithm that not only gives us the approximate matching, but also tells us what are the differences. And at the same time, we develop an accelerator for that, right? You understand uh, the point, right? So it's, uh, it's all about working on the algorithm, working sometimes on the way that we program the system, for example, the um, um, middle layers, uh, but uh, as well as uh, uh, creating an accelerator that is uh, nicely tailored for the specific workload that you uh, want to uh, you want to run, and that's another example. This is another one. This one is an accelerator for climate modeling um, using FPGAs with uh, high bandwidth memory. Have you guys heard of high bandwidth memory, HBM memory, right? That the most powerful GPUs have these days, and FPGAs. So in this case, we use an FPGA with high bandwidth memory. This is another um, interesting um, example of accelerator is for time series analysis. Time series are everywhere, uh, for example, in earthquake detection or also in electrocardiograms. In the end, is like a, a series of data that is being produced in real time, right? Uh, um, um, earth, um, um, for example, to, the uh, to detect earthquakes, uh, you can analyze, or what scientists do is analyzing what are the signals that are coming from the earth, right? And uh, at some point, uh, the pattern in these signals is going to change, and that uh, somehow uh, allow you to say in advance when one earthquake is going to be. So uh, uh, it can be uh, useful for, for prevention, or for example, if you have certain disease in your uh, heart with an electrocardiogram and identifying a specific patterns in the electrocardiogram, you will be able to see, or the doctor will be able to see if you have that heart disease or not, right? So uh, in those kind of applications that you see us from completely different domains, we need to use time series. And um, so, and, and these time series are, um, are, you know, they are costly to analyze. And that's why it's good to have accelerators because they are uh, important for many different applications. So that's what we proposed here. Uh, it's not only about understanding the workload itself, the time series uh, themselves, but also uh, designing a proper accelerator for that. And here it's a more, one more work on the FPEA um, work with HVM memory for other data intensive applications. I mentioned uh, climate modeling first, but also for bioinformatics, uh, this is uh, one example. And, um, <clears throat> and by the way, about bioinformatics, um, this is a, uh, for now is a recommended reading. Uh, it's a good introduction to uh, bioinformatics uh, and, and probably will be one of your required readings at some point, accelerating genome analysis, a primer on an ongoing journey. Uh, more examples. I talk about graph processing in the beginning as another field of uh, current applications where we see a lot of developments, for example, uh, regarding accelerators. This is a, a processing in memory accelerator um, for parallel graph processing. Uh, so graphs are very sparse. You guys know with a graph, right? And uh, you, you know that a graph is... Um, normally has an adjacency matrix, and this adjacency matrix gives you the information about how each node or vertex in the graph is connected to others, right? Um, however, in most of the graphs, think about uh, social networks, for example, graphs representing social networks where each of the nodes in the graph is each of the users. 
not all users of Facebook or uh, Instagram are connected to all other users, right? In fact, the connections are very sparse because, well, maybe uh, some of us have uh, hundreds of friends or followers or thousands, uh, and only very few people, like uh, super popular, famous people, have uh, millions of, uh, of followers. And instead, and, and, and still, they are not connected to everyone. Even if you are Selena Gomez and have uh, 30 million followers, 30 million is 30 million, is not everyone, right? So graphs are very, very sparse. And because they are sparse, it doesn't make sense to store the entire adjacency matrix in memory uh, because that adjacency matrix is going to have many zeros, right? Because most people are not, connect are not connected to all other people. So <clears throat> we would store that adjacency matrix as a, a sparse matrix in a compressed format. And now what's the problem with compressed formats? The problem is that they usually require uh, sparse and almost random memory accesses to access the relevant data. If I want to, um, if I want to um, uh, find what are the friends of uh, two people here, uh, maybe these two people are sitting next to each other, but the place where their neighbors, their friends are stored might be in completely separate places in memory. So it's not like the simple sequential or streaming access pattern that I mentioned in the beginning where you access all elements of the array. No, it's like, oh, I need you to access here and then I need you to access there. So they, these two values are not even in the same cache line. So bringing them to the processor is very inefficient. That's the kind of a scenario or the kind of memory access pattern where uh, processing in memory can help. Because instead of saying, oh, bring me the information about this friend who is here and the information about that other friend who is there, bring the information here and then let's do some computation with that information. That's gonna be very costly. Instead of doing that, what I can do is say, oh, I have to operate on data related to this friend and data related to this other friend. What I'm going to do is send the instructions, send the computation to the memory and inside the memory, I'm going to have a small processor that performs that computation for me. And that's what this uh, scalable processing in memory accelerator for parallel graph processing proposes. But it's just one example <clears throat> accelerator for that. Uh, we, will, uh, we will see more uh, actually in the uh, next lecture or in, in next week. Uh, this is another example of uh, processing in memory work is uh, about Google workloads on consumer devices. Uh, in this one, um, we focus on analyzing the data movement bottlenecks on some uh, consumer workloads from Google. Uh, for example, uh, TensorFlow Mobile, uh, the VP9 encoder, decoder, uh, what else? Uh, the Chrome uh, browser. So for all of that, Amir Ali, who is the first author, he was also a PhD student of the group, now working in Google, I think. Um, he analyzed all, the, all these workloads and, 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 and studied how much data movement is uh, in these workloads. Data movement meaning bringing data from the memory to the processor. And, uh, and he realized that uh, there are several important operations in these workloads that are very inefficient from the point of view of the movement of data. You bring something from memory, it takes you many cycles to bring this cache line from memory to the processor. And now after bringing it, you only use it once. And maybe you don't even use all bytes in that cache line. Maybe you just use a few values in, the, in, the, in that cache line. So it's a waste of time and it's a waste of energy as well. So after doing that analysis of the workloads, remember we are going from the stack, from the, uh, in the, the entire stack, from the problem and the algorithm or the application itself to the hardware. So after understanding those workloads, those bottlenecks, sorry, he was able to design tailored processing in memory architectures for those operations. And that's uh, something, uh, um, yeah, really uh, nice. And, 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 and probably you will see this in, in, in real devices uh, sometime soon. Uh, 
Another example of accelerator for processing in memory, this one is for pointed chasing applications. You guys are familiar with uh, linked lists, for example, uh, and you know that, well, you will have to go wherever the linked list tells you, right? That's why each uh, uh, tuple in a linked list has a pointer to somewhere else in memory, right? That's uh, that, Those uh, kind of pointer chasing applications are going to also uh, cause a lot of uh, inefficient data movement. So uh, processing in memory accelerator for those is also uh, uh, pretty good. And there are, there are yeah, some, some more examples here. We have a couple of slides about these cross-layer abstractions with the so-called expressive memory. This was um, some work presented in 2018 uh, by Nandita Vijay Kumar. She was also a PhD student of Professor Mudlu. Now she's a professor at the University of Toronto. And um, in this work and in another work that you'll, you'll have in, in a later slide, um, she proposed a way of uh, providing users, provide, providing programmers of uh, efficient ways of communicating information about the applications to the hardware. Because uh, you know, if, you, if you think about how you um, usually program, either if in Z, Python, or whatever programming model, programming language you use, uh, you are doing, I mean, you are programming the same way, right? You are not telling um, the hardware, you are not telling the system uh, any specific characteristics that you know about your program. But you about your program might know, you as a programmer, especially if you are a good programmer after taking this computer architecture course, you know what are the kind of accesses. I gave you the example of the graph processing earlier, right? So in graph processing, we know that there are random access patterns or almost random access patterns, but there are also streaming access patterns. If I'm, uh, if I want to, you know, if I if I want to go one by one over the, over the vertices of my graph, and you are the vertices of my graph, I will start from there and will go one by one. So I have a sequential access. But if after that I want to check your friends, your friends might be here, or your friends might be in a different room in the uh, main building, or might be in a completely different uh, country, right? So. Uh, very far away. So in graph processing, there are streaming access patterns and there are random access patterns. It would be nice to provide, the, in, I, I know that, and I'm the guy who programs that. So it would be nice for me to, prog to provide the hardware with information about what type of accesses the hardware can expect when I'm accessing this array or this other array. Because probably I can tell the hardware, the accesses here are going to be in streaming while the accesses here are going to be strided or are going to be completely random, right? If I have a way of providing that information to the hardware, I can, the hardware can exploit a specific hardware optimizations to improve the performance and the energy efficiency. And that's what the X-Men work proposes. Uh, these higher level program semantics that the programmer can provide to the hardware in order to perform more efficient execution by taking advantage of many different optimizations related to cache management, page, page placement, uh, memory uh, compression, prefetching, etc. Okay? Okay, and this is um, kind of a similar approach, but more focused on the um, operation on GPUs. Okay, any questions? No questions? Okay. Now another example. This one is about uh, heterogeneous memories. Uh, this characterizing application memory error vulnerability to optimize data center cost uh, via heterogeneous reliability memory. We are talking about heterogeneity in the system, not only in the type of processors that we have. We have CPUs, GPUs, uh, TPUs, and other accelerators, but we also have different types of memories. And I'm not saying I'm not talking about just, I mean, I'm not talking about different levels of the, of the hierarchy, like cache, main memory, storage. No, I'm talking about having different types of memory in the same level. I'm talking about having a memory that is more reliable. Imagine main memory, right? I may have DIMMs or chips that are more reliable because they are more tested. Uh, and, and yeah, you can trust them. Maybe even they, they, they might be even faster, but probably if they are so good, they will have less capacity, right? Because there are always trade-offs and they may have other deems or other chips with um, um, 
uh, with uh, maybe higher capacity memory, but maybe not so reliable because it doesn't have, uh, I don't know, ECC uh, mechanisms to fix errors or they might be slower. So I may have different types of memory, even in the same level of the hierarchy, right? Uh, so it could be good to understand the applications well in order to map the data of the different applications to the right place. I may have um, applications that are more uh, resilient to errors while others are more vulnerable. For example, here you have three uh, random applications with their data, A, B, and C, and they have different memory error vulnerability. There are uh, applications with uh, very sensitive, very vulnerable data. I don't want bit flips here because otherwise the computation will be wrong or things will go uh, wrongly. And I also have applications that use more tolerant data. We were talking about robustness in deep neural networks, for example, a few slides ago, right? So there are workloads with different characteristics and data with different characteristics, even in the same workload. So I can use of different types of memories for these different type of data, more reliable memory on more low cost memory. Uh, and this is a heterogeneous memory system. Uh, what makes uh, memory more reliable? But probably that it's uh, ECC protected. Uh, that means that you need to spend certain capacity, amount of capacity uh, for the ECC bits. Uh, so it makes the entire thing more costly or those chips are well tested, which also makes them more expensive. And at the same time, you may have uh, low cost memory with no ECC or parity bits and less tested chips. Okay, we can use both. And if we want to optimize our system for cost, we probably want to have the minimum amount of memory, of reliable memory that can still make my system work and the larger amount of low cost memory that can still make my system work, right? Uh, well, if you understand uh, applications and the data that they use, uh, you can probably um, you can probably do that, right? Um, and and here you have uh, well that the, this paper was presented in 2014, and and you see here some uh, numbers uh, reduction in the uh, cost of server hardware by 4.7 percent. You might think that that's not a lot, but uh, if you think about the cost of these. Uh, uh, large data centers is probably uh, a good amount of money. And, and also in terms of availability target, uh, also pretty good results. And here, uh, a little bit more information about this work. The first thing, because remember, we are doing hardware software co-design. So first thing is to understand the workloads well. We characterize and classify the applications and their data, depending on how uh, memory error tolerant they are and then we map them to the uh, more reliable or less reliable memory, depending on what are the uh, characteristics uh, of the uh, data and the applications. Um, another example, uh, also a pretty nice one, is uh, the virtual block interface. Another example of hardware software co-design. Uh, this uh, proposal from 2020 is um, about um, kind of uh, redesigning the uh, virtual memory uh, entirely, uh, um, providing memory controllers with the capability of allocating memory and, and making everything more efficient. This uh, will probably be also a, a required or recommended reading um, in the course. Okay, any questions? No? It's good that everything is so clear. <laughs> so, okay, so, but uh, yeah, we, we still have so, uh, some time, uh, I guess, like uh, 27 minutes, um, and, and I have, uh, yeah, more than 200 <laughs> slides. <laughs> so I'm going to keep talking about things, interesting things that are happening in computer architecture today. I think it's, uh, it's uh, good uh, because it's, uh, for me, an opportunity to start introducing processing in memory, which is... Uh, topic that uh, concerns me a lot uh, and a very nice way of improving the performance and energy efficiency of uh, computing systems. But before that, uh, let me give you one real example of heterogeneous memory. Well, this is not just, this is not heterogeneous by, itse heterogeneous by itself because it's just a single DIMM. This is the um, uh, Intel obtained per persistent memory that appeared in 2019. I think that these kind of DIMMs have been um, kind of, um, 
um, discontinued, probably not so success successful from the commercial point of view. But uh, I think that very, very uh, interesting from a uh, 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 research uh, viewpoint uh, because you know you you could combine these sort these dims with uh, DRAM dims. Uh, these are slower. They are. Uh, based on this uh, 3D X point technology, desire is lower, but they are also higher capacity. So it's um, uh, related to the example that we saw earlier, uh, just just before about the um, heterogeneous memories. Um, here you you can see um, well these as an example. And um, but you know um, developing th uh, things these these appear in 2019. But usually developing things takes a lot of time. And, and actually this uh, paper from Professor Mudlu from 2019 was uh, pioneering in the study of phase change memory as a replacement of uh, DRAM. Uh, and uh, supposedly the Intel obtained memory is based on phase change memory. And what they were doing in this work is exactly, you know, um, architecting phase change memory, creating the memory arrays and the um, uh, row buffers and, and anything needed to make use of phase change memory as main memory, as an alternative to DRAM. And as you see, well, it took 10 years for industry to take all those ideas and fabricate their, uh, their uh, uh, PCN DIMMs, assuming that uh, 3DX point is PCM that we think it is. And uh, this is a shorter paper. If you uh, want to take a look, for sure, uh, we will talk about these uh, papers later because uh, they are uh, very important in the context of non-volatile memories. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's a, a really a pioneering idea, same as this wafer scale engine is a huge uh, accelerator that, uh, that uh, I mentioned uh, earlier, but it makes sense to fabricate these kind of things uh, because now we need to compute a lot to train these deep neural networks that are so uh, so costly, but at the same time so promising or so useful. And there was a first version in 2019. This is the same slide I showed you earlier, 2021. And, um, and yeah, it's a pretty exciting system. So this is one of the interesting things that is happening today in computer architecture. Same as this admin processing in DRAM engine uh, that I showed you a picture of this, of the machine with these uh, DIMMs uh, before. You're going to see the same slide uh, soon as well. Um, this is a processing in memory system or processing in DRAM because the memory is DRAM. As you see, how this looks is like a regular DDR4 DIMM. The key novelty here is that each of these pin chips contains not only memory arrays, but also uh, but also uh, small processors uh, that uh, that we can use for computation, and uh, and this is uh, very promising. This sort of system, this uh, kind of um, uh, or this type of memory is very promising because it can accelerate applications a lot and it can save a lot of energy. Why is that? Because remember, instead of bringing uh, information about the neighbor from here and information about the neighbor from there and go all the way through the memory bus until uh, we have the data in registers or in the cache, uh, what we can do is computing uh, in the memory itself and we would be saving a lot of energy and a lot of execution cycles. Uh, to motivate that or to make you believe what I'm saying, I'm showing you this uh, slide from um, Professor Daly uh, presented at High Peak 2015, where he compares the energy that is consumed for a double precision operation, a like 64 bit double precision addition, for example, 20 picojoules, to accessing that amount of data from DRAM, either a read or a write, 16 nanojoules. As you see, we are talking about almost three orders of magnitude more energy consumption. So it's like 1,000, almost 1,000 times more expensive to bring the two values that I need to operate on from memory to the processor than performing the addition or the multiplication that I want to do with these two numbers. So that I think is a, a pretty good motivation to study processing in memory techniques. Or uh, in this other picture uh, or in this other graph, uh, we have like a similar comparison, even more detail, because these are 32-bit uh, operations, either an addition or 32-bit integers 
or addition on floating point, in, uh, floating point values or an access to the register file, multiplication of integers or uh, floating point numbers or access uh, of those 32-bit elements from the cache, which is SRAM memory, or from the main memory, which is, is, is uh, DRAM memory. And uh, well, you can see it's like, uh, uh, yeah, 64, 60, uh, sorry, 6,400 times more energy a memory access than a simple integer addition. So it's bringing data to the processor is extremely costly. And that's why this sort of solution might make a lot of sense. This is just a picture of those uh, DIMMs with processing in memory capabilities that are fabricated by a French startup called AppMem. Uh, there have well they they, they have they have uh, already uh, released several versions of the architecture. The first one uh, had processors running at only 267 megahertz. As you see, pretty slow processors if we compare them to the actual CPU and x86 CPU um, is uh, way faster. Uh, but yeah, well they are increasing this frequency a little bit. They, actually, the most uh, recent um, um, DIMMs that I'm aware of, I think they run at 450 megahertz. But in the end, there is a limit for that. And probably the limit is 500 or 600 megahertz. So it's not that much. But uh, still, even if the processor is slow, uh, we can save a lot of time because remember, it's super costly to bring the data from the memory to the processor. And this is again the a uh, picture of this processing in memory system or memory centric computing system with uh, the dual socket CPU, some deans of DRAM and some deans of this PIM enabled memory. In total, there are 20 of these deans of PIM enabled memory uh, that uh, makes uh, a total of uh, 2,560 processors, PIM, PIM cores, or uh, they call them DPUs, DRAM processing units. And in total, this also has like 160 gigabytes of uh, PIM enabled memory, which is also an interesting advantage with the respect to other accelerators. If you look at the most uh, advanced GPUs these days, the uh, most advanced one, I, I think that the latest one from NVIDIA has 92 um, gigabytes of HVM3 memory, which is like a lot as well, but, uh, but HVM3 memory is way more expensive than uh, DDR4. Well, <clears throat> you're going to learn about this system because I will talk in detail about it next week. Uh, but yeah, if you are impatient, uh, that's a talk that I uh, can recommend to you. It's a talk that I gave um, a few years, a few weeks ago um, at the SRC TechCon conference. It's just 15 minutes or even less, it's like 12 minutes. Um, if you want to learn a little bit on about this system or want to start learning a little bit about this system, <clears throat> about the and about the type of applications that can work well here. Um, we have been <clears throat> working already for uh, uh, three, four years with this system. This is an earlier paper where we um, did an analysis of the um, uh, entire um, PIM system from AppMem, and uh, we developed a benchmark suite with the aim of uh, understanding what are application domains where this system can perform well. And I may show you some results of our analysis uh, next week. But as you see, well, in total, there are 16 different workloads, uh, pretty different because you see like, uh, things like dense linear algebra or sparse linear algebra, they have different requirements. Um, so it's good to see uh, when something, when, well, if, if this architecture is good for, <clears throat> for example, the sparse matrix vector multiplication or, or dense matrix vector multiplication, uh, or data analytics, or graph processing, neural networks, uh, bioinformatics, for example, the needle and bunch algorithm, um, et cetera. So it's important to understand uh, as well the systems, characterize them, and figure out what's the, uh, what, what, what is their workload suitability? What are the workloads that they are suitable to? And, um, and as, as usual, everything is open source. Um, the print benchmarks are open source. Uh, you might need to access, or you may access this uh, repository in a few weeks because we will have a, a lab about uh, programming this uh, admin pin system. And here in, <clears throat> in the print benchmark suite, you have uh, some um, good examples of, um, of programs uh, for this architecture. Um, this is a longer version of our paper, a longer, 
uh, talk uh, that they uh, gave as well about our first work, another slide about this, a shorter one. Well, uh, many of the, um, some of the resources that you can find in, in your YouTube channel. Uh, but yeah, it's not the only type of processing in memory that you can find in the real world these days. I already mentioned these um, FPGA-based near memory acceleration uh, with uh, HV, uh, FPGAs with HVM memory, which is a way of doing processing near memory. Uh, but there are uh, also other more, um, um, uh, let's say even more novel approaches to processing in memory, for example, from Samsung, uh, this is from February uh, 2021, where they announced their first processing in memory architecture, new processing in memory architecture uh, for AI with computing capabilities in the uh, HVM memory for AI, for machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, as you will see, and we will go in more detail next week, but as you will see, it's a completely different architecture from the one of uh, AppMem. This one is more specialized because they are targeting, um, they are targeting a specific type of applications that are machine learning, neural networks, and remember that machine learning and neural networks, a key operation is a matrix multiplication or dot product operations, basically multiply and accumulate operations. So those are the operations that they, um, uh, they um, uh, embedded uh, in memory. Um, HVM memory is a 3D stack memory. So it has several layers of DRAM memory, like putting um, on top of each other different dies of DRAM, and then uh, they uh, drill some holes in order to, uh, well, to place the wires that go through the stack to the buffer die, which is the, what is connected to the processor, right? So what these guys did was modifying some of the layers of the HVM uh, memory in order to integrate this programmable compute unit. It's like a very small processor, you can call it processor. These are it's more like a SIMD unit uh, with a very relatively simple pipeline, only five stages to read some instruction for, from a specific uh, registers that contain instructions, but we don't have many of them, only 32 instructions. So the program needs to be pretty simple, but probably you don't need more instructions for just a multiply and accumulate operation, right? And then there is a pipeline decoder, and then there is an array of multipliers and an array of 16 others to perform matrix, uh, uh, matrix, matrix operations or matrix vector multiplication operations. Uh, because they are specialized, their instruction set is uh, pretty simple. In total, nine different instructions. And as you see, most of them are, well, or, the, or those related to computation, uh, floating point uh, operations are addition, multiplication, uh, multiply and accumulate and multiply and add uh, only for uh, one data type is floating point 16. Uh, why is that? Because floating point 16 is a pretty much used um, format in machine learning and especially for inference. So that's why they decided to create units only for floating point 16. <clears throat> and one of the reasons for that is that uh, integrating computing inside the DRAM layers, inside the DRAM dice, is, um, is pretty complex and actually way more challenging than doing it with CMOS uh, logic, with CMOS technology. Uh, but in the end, they made it, right? They need to make their design decisions based, based on what are the workloads that they are targeting. And, uh, and that's uh, why they, they made these decisions. As you see, they have modified the... Uh, memory banks, the DRAM banks, to uh, replace some of the, uh, or part of the cell array of the different banks with the necessary logic for computation. As you see in this case, there is one of these PCU blocks for every two banks. So the PCU block can read data from here or from here and then uh, store the results uh, somewhere else. And also they have some, uh, a few registers in, in order to keep temporary data. <clears throat> It's not the only proposal from Samsung. We also have this uh, uh, as a nice one, interesting one as well. This is a dim based solution. As you see here, the idea is to uh, place a small FPEA on top of the dim, and uh, the whatever you program in this FPEA will have direct access to the memory ranks. And this way, we can enjoy 
more or the application can enjoy more bandwidth. Uh, if you have, let's say, two ranks per DIMM, you can access both ranks at the same time. So uh, for free, let's say you have twice as much uh, memory bandwidth. Or this other one is from SK Hynix. It's called Acceleratory Memory. It's kind of similar to the first one I showed you from uh, Samsung because it's also targeting the same uh, type of workloads, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. In this case, instead of um, HBM memory, they are using GDDR6 memory. And, um, and, and yeah, in this case, they have what processing unit near each bank. Uh, but if you look at what the processing unit has, it has multiply and accumulate units. And, uh, and it also has uh, special units for activation functions that are uh, also really, really important in machine learning algorithms, as you probably know. And, and this is another view of it. Uh, this is how the processing unit looks. Observe that we have an array of multipliers and then another tree. How can you use this? Well, for dot product operations, right? You, uh, you, you, you uh, uh, input, uh, let's say, the row and the column and perform the multiplication and then uh, perform a reduction with the other tree. And it also has this unit for the activation functions. <clears throat> Maybe we will elaborate a little bit more on this uh, in the next lecture. I also like the fact that they have this supplementary SRAM buffer uh, uh, somewhere in the chip that can be used to move data between DRAM banks or can also be used uh, to store the uh, input vector or the input image, for example, that is coming from, uh, from the processor, from the CPU, for example, or from somewhere else. Um, and the processing units can get data either from the uh, DRAM bank or from this uh, global buffer. And this is another uh, processing in memory architecture. This one is from Alibaba and it's for, uh, for uh, recommendation systems. Uh, that's why you get those nice recommendations every time you go into AliExpress. Uh, to buy something, uh, observe that this is a, a kind of different approach, but we also call it processing in memory because we are, or they are placing the logic near the memory as well. In this case, there are two different layers or two different dies. One is DRAM, the other one is logic. And in the logic die, there are some compute units for recommendation systems. Um, well, we are not going to go into the details, but as you see, the, these are also different for different parts of the uh, recommendation system. Anyway, if you want to learn, I, I, I will probably talk in more detail about these architectures. Well, I don't know how much more detail, but a little bit more uh, next week. But if you want to uh, go deeper into each of them, uh, I can recommend you these lectures from our Processing in Memory course. Okay, uh, what else? Well, it's, um, uh, well, it's uh, just eight minutes until the end of the class. Um, I must have spoken too much because I was expecting to reach a slide 200, but I think it's fine because uh, the upcoming slides are about processing in memory are, and we are going to talk about processing in memory uh, next week and the week after as well. Um, just let me conclude here um, with this introduction to processing in memory uh, and uh, kind of a um, distinction with, be, between these two main approaches that we can see in processing in memory in the real world and also in the academic and industry research. Uh, we can talk about processing near memory and processing using memory. I think that the concept of processing in memory is, sorry, processing near memory is self-explanatory, right? You have memory and you put near memory, you put something to compute. That something is an accelerator or a more or less general purpose core. And those are the examples that you have just seen in real world systems, some of them commercially available, like that one from AppMem, other prototypes like those from Samsung or from SK Hynix, but probably will be in the market soon as well. Uh, if you look at those, what you see are the memory arrays and near the memory arrays, there is some sort of processing element, either a more general purpose core, that's the case of AppMem, PIM, or more specialized thing, that's the case of Samsung or SK Hynix. That's why we call it processing near memory. 
another trend, another approach, which is, um, I, I would say, is um, more forward-looking, uh, but also fascinating, is called processing using memory. And processing using memory is based on the operation, the analog operation of memory itself. Remember that I talked earlier about uh, how DRAM works. DRAM is composed of many cells. Each of the cells is a capacitor and an access transistor. And when we want to read or write data in one of these rows, the first thing we have to do is to open the row. So we activate the corresponding word line. The uh, uh, capacitors start leaking the charge onto the bit line and few cycles later, we activate the sense amplifiers and this means that we can read or write, okay? Observe that in the normal operation of DRAM, we are only activating one row at a time. And that's something that makes sense, right? Because we want to access a specific bits that are in one row. What would happen if we activate two rows at a time? Or what would happen if we activate three rows at a time? If we activate three rows at a time, connected to each bit line, we have three cells, three capacitors. So the three of them start sharing their charge with the bit line. What is the value that we are going to be able to read from the sense amplifier? It depends on what are the three values that we have in the corresponding capacitors, right? If we have one, 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 then it's clear, right? We will read one. If we have zero, 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 we will read zero. What would happen if we open three rows where two of them have all ones and one of them has all zeros? What is most likely to happen? That we will get one, right? And the other way around, if we have two zeros and one, one, most likely we will get zero. That operation is called majority, majority function. It's a way of doing uh, um, um, Boolean algebra. It's not and, it's not or, it's majority. With the majority operation, we can create and, and we can create nor. Uh, sorry, we can create and and or. If, uh, in addition, we invent a way of doing not as well, we have a functionally complete set of uh, uh, Boolean operations. And we can use that for much more complex computation, additions, multiplications, and anything that you may think about, okay? So that's a really promising um, approach uh, is still under development. Several people in our group are working on that. And it's called processing using DRAM. It's a type of processing using memory. And we will elaborate on it uh, in a couple of weeks. So thank you very much for your attention. I think it's, uh, that's all for today. Um, and uh, I will see you uh, again tomorrow. I hope that you uh, enjoyed. And um, I hope that you are excited about continuing learning in this course. That's all. Have a nice evening.